But really tonight is about Sir Edmund Hillary, and it's just, we're so rapt to have him here. Um, obviously everybody knows him from Everest fame, his knighthood that year. Uh, in 1957, his work with Sir Vivian Fuchs uh, to drive the first tractors, the Fuchsen tractors, to the South Pole and the Transantarctic Expedition, obviously uh, the first time that had been attempted since Shackleton tried to cross the continent. What he wasn't, what many of you won't know, is he was the first to climb Mount Herschel at Cape Hallett in 1967. And Ed's given us a special request for the Royal New Zealand Air Force to take him into Herschel when he goes back on Thursday. So yeah, we're going to try and honour that. But also his fabulous adventures, the jet boat trip up the Ganges River, his work as the New Zealand Ambassador in India and New Delhi, and uh, hugely uh, recognised for his work in the Himalayan Trust, which he set up in 1961 to raise funds for schools, hospitals, bridges in the Kumbu in Nepal, and to put his money where his mouth was back into that uh, very important region. But most importantly tonight, we're here because Ed established Scott Base at Pram Point. Ed origin originally had a vision to put Scott Base over at Butter Point. Unfortunately, our, our Navy ship couldn't get in there, and Ed quickly built up a relationship with Admiral Dufek who uh, suggested that uh, Ed come and have a look at a bit of prime real estate over the back of McMurdo. So uh, <laughs> Ed took the offer up and I think they even gave you plan much the same as we work now. <laughs> so uh, we do acknowledge the United States for the assistance that we've had and Ed had in establishing Scott Base at Pram Point. And I know when Ed, I was reading Ed's diary last night and he said, Besides the advantage of getting in here and being close to the Americans, it had an absolutely magnificent view. And I think that was probably the, the more the reason why we were there. <laughs> but it's special tonight that 85 years old and 47 years later on, Ed is still following his dream. And that's why he's an inspiration to us as Kiwis and, and to many of you around the world. His, Ed has a dream and he follows it and he's lived a life of adventure and he's been an absolute inspiration to us all. He really established the close relationship between uh, New Zealand and the United States with his friendship with Admiral Dufat. So much so uh, that he, he first started the uh, Kiwi practice of using any rejects from the United States had in their dump and things like that and we still go on. <laughs> and we're very happy donors of anything that you haven't got a great use for. <laughs> I was talking to Ed the other night in reading his book, because now I'm in charge of the New Zealand program, I'm, I'm responsible for all the safety procedures. And what Ed got up to in 1957 with mate Dave and I's hair curl, Ed had an Oster plane and a Beaver plane in the ice cliffs over near Scott Base. Of course, the United States wasn't able to fly during the winter. <laughs> but Ed managed to, after every blizzard and every full moon night, he dug those planes out and uh, took them for a bit of a burn. <laughs> this is right through the winter. Ed and his team, John Clayton, Bill Cranfield, kept on flying those planes. As us, they even uh, took some lights off the Ferguson tractor to be able to make them operate at night. <laughs> and Ed was telling me it was great envy to the pilots here at McMurdo who weren't allowed to do such a thing. And I asked Ed, was there any reason why, why they did it, any scientific reason why they did it? He said, no, we just used to love to beat up McMurdo. <laughs> <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, Sir Ed is here one more time to beat up McMurdo. <laughs> well, thank you very much ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a great pleasure for me to uh, be back here again in uh, McMurdo. Uh, it was a long time ago uh, when I made my uh, first visit and uh, it's very true that uh, Admiral George Dufek uh, played a very important part not only in the location of Scott Base but in everything really uh, we did uh, in this area. Uh, much of our uh, second-hand equipment uh, came uh, from your uh, rubbish dump and uh, <coughs> it proved extremely useful 
uh, to we uh, poverty-stricken uh, New Zealanders. However, in return, uh, we did notice that there was a considerable stream of, uh, <coughs> of American friends who would come over and join the bar in, uh, uh, at Scott Base. And so we built up very close relationships. Now, my friend and companion from Everest, George Lowe, who was the other New Zealander in the expedition, we were dining together in London late in 1953. Uh, I was, of course, uh, a New Zealander, uh, but I have on odd occasions uh, been uh, mistaken for people like Australians and, and, uh, uh, and people from Britain. But we were dining in London and George commented, I've just been talking to a chap who wants to cross from one side of the Antarctic to the other. He sounds a bit crazy to me, but he says I can go along too. He'd like to meet you and show you his plans. Well, I certainly hadn't thought of going to the Antarctic. But like most people of my generation, I had read the absorbing stories of Scott, Shackleton and Amundsen and felt enormous respect and admiration for their deeds. My ideas of the Antarctic were hazy in the extreme and if I thought about it at all, I imagined a somber land of bitter cold and heroic suffering, of serious men dedicated to impossible ideals and of lonely crosses out in the snowy waste. A little bit unlike uh, things around here at the moment. Well, this wasn't really my cup of tea at all, but it sounded an interesting venture and I decided it would do no harm to learn more about it. A few days later, I climbed up some long flights of London stairs to a dingy little office and met Dr. Vivian Fuchs. I really knew nothing about him. In fact, I'd only heard his name for the first time from George Lowe. But I was very impressed by his forceful personality and his air of determination and confidence. Fuchs was about 45 years old then he was powerfully built and obviously kept himself in fine physical trim. He took me over to a large map and with unmistakable enthusiasm commenced explaining his transantarctic project. Well, it was certainly an ambitious plan in those days to make the first crossing of the southern continent from the Weddell Sea to the Ross Sea see through the South Pole. It was to be the fulfilment of the dream that Ernest Shackleton had failed to carry out some 40 years before when his ship was crushed and sank in the tough Weddell Sea pack ice. I had the feeling that Bunny Fuchs was interested in me becoming involved as well. But during the next two years my activities were largely confined to mountaineering, particularly in the Himalayas. But my interest in the Antarctic was steadily growing. More than anything, I developed a growing admiration for Sir Ernest Shackleton and his unrivaled qualities of tough leadership and his ability to quickly change his plans when considerations to demanded it. At the beginning of June 1955, I received a cable offering me the leadership of the New Zealand Support Party, and I immediately accepted, as I had a rather a habit of doing. Life became very busy indeed, <coughs> raising funds, selecting the team, mostly mountaineers, 
and accumulating the vast amount of equipment we would need. Fuchs planned to do a preliminary sail down into the Weddell Sea and select a suitable site for his initial base camp, and I would go too. Our small ship, the Theron, rolled its way down the Atlantic to the beautiful South Georgia Island and then headed into the pack ice of the Weddell Sea. For some unknown reason, Bunny Fuchs believed we could drive right down through the middle of the pack ice, but unfortunately he was wrong. The ice became heavier and heavier, and finally we became immovably stuck. The whole thing was to try and head north again through the open sea. <coughs> well, it was a great struggle, and a whole month before we entered the sea clear of pack ice. We then commenced moving steadily down the open water on the east coast of the Weddell Sea and finally reached Vasel Bay at the bottom of the Weddell Sea. A wild and energetic period of unloading followed as we were much against schedule. Finally, all equipment was ashore and we waved goodbye to the wintering over team and sailed back steadily to the north. Now the job of my New Zealand team was to establish a base south of New Zealand in McMurdo Sound and lay out a fuel and food depot for Fuchs on the Polar Plateau. We battled our way south in our little wooden ship the Endeavour, until the great volcanic cone of Mount Erebus dominated the horizon. Fuchs' plan was for us to establish our base on Butter Point to the west of McMurdo Sound and ascend the Ferrar Glacier, which Scott had climbed many years before. But when we investigated the area, <coughs> we found it really quite unsuitable. We became stuck in the pack ice <coughs> and were only released by Admiral Dufek and his great icebreaker, the Glacier. He recommended to me, he had me over for a, a, a bite to eat, and he recommended to me that we try Pram Point on Ross Island near his big base in McMurdo Sound. And he supplied a helicopter uh, for me to be flown there. Well, Pram Point proved an ideal base site. And here we established Scott Base, New Zealand's first Antarctic base, and a very suitable and comfortable place it proved to be. Our program was a, quite an extensive one. We had a wide scientific program carried out extensive geology and surveyed in previously unexplored areas. The Antarctic winter passed quickly as we were very busy. I don't think anybody in our over a winter base of 23 people ever uh, got bored uh, being here in the Antarctic. But as the sun returned, we made our preparations to head south. I had decided uh, that we would use our farm tractors uh, to try and get quite a long way south. And now the Massey Ferguson farm tractors had one enormous advantage to me. Uh, we had five of them and they were all free. And uh, in good old uh, Kiwi fashion, uh, anything that was free uh, was always are worth examining carefully. <laughs> so we got everything ready and then when the uh, sun returned uh, with heavy loads on uh, our tractors, uh, we moved onto the uh, Ross ice shelf 
with our strange vehicles. We were still in sight of the cross on Observation Hill when we struck our first problem. A heavily laden sledge broke through the top of a concealed crevasse and we had to unload the drums of fuel in order to extricate it. We pushed on again, only to strike soft snow and have the greatest difficulty in moving our loads. That night we camped only a few miles from Scott Base and I wondered if Admiral Dufek's forecast of failure would indeed prove to be true. But next day we reduced our loads, desperate to make more mileage, and slowly we started moving faster and faster. For day after day, we made our way across the great ice shelf. Whenever the surface was hard, we made fast time. When the surface was soft, we laboured and struggled. It was a tremendous moment when we reached the bottom of the Skelton Glacier and pulled up alongside the depot we had established there the previous autumn by our small aircraft. Already we were experiencing mechanical problems and uh, uh, Admiral Dufek had uh, given us uh, one of his second-hand weasels that, that he didn't require anymore and it was uh, part of our team. Uh, but it started uh, giving mechanical problems. But our two ingenious engineers, uh, Murray Ellis and Jim Bates, rigged up a bipod, lifted the engine out of its housing, replaced the part and then lowered it all back into place. Every, everything done in minus 30 degrees Celsius temperatures. I regarded the Skelton Glacier as the most unpredictable part of our journey. Would we be able to make the 9,000 foot rise in altitude that it entailed? What problems would we have with the many crevasses that could be seen so clearly from the air? Well, in the lower Skelton, we were constantly harassed by wind, sweeping down from the snowfields above. Visibility was often minimal, and we just had to push on, hoping we could keep clear of the worst crevasse areas. We commenced bumping over row after row of crevasses, although few of them at this stage were large enough to cause us much distress. As we started gaining height amongst the peaks, the winds decreased, but our fear of crevasses became much greater. We were having to wind our way in and out amongst unpleasant open areas, and there were few moments of the day in which we weren't operating in constant tension. We had no crevasse detection equipment, apart from the tractors themselves, and frequently our first indication that we're in a dangerous area was when the big back wheels of the tractors would knock a hole in the lid of a crevasse. The upper Skelton Glacier was a beautiful place, and for a while the surface was much easier as we travelled under the great slopes of Mount Huggins. We reached the neve of the glacier and became involved once again in constant wind and drifting snow. Despite our fear of crevasse areas, we pushed on, only hoping that luck would be on our side. Navigation became a considerable problem and frequently visibility became so bad that we had to stop and wait for a few hours until the winds had eased. Temperatures were mostly around 
minus 30 to minus 40 Celsius. And as we had no insulation in our tractors, it was rather unpleasant work driving in our unheated cabs. But it was a tremendous moment, for me perhaps the greatest on the expedition, when we emerged through the driving snow to see the site of the Plateau Depot half a mile away. We had established it from the air and despite all forecasts we had climbed the Skelton Glacier and reached the open spaces of the Antarctic Plateau. Bad weather at the Plateau severely restricted the flying in of supplies but slowly the job was completed and we were able to load the sledges and move on again. We travelled west and south in an area of constant winds and drifting snow. Some of the surface was very hard indeed, with giant sastrugi, which tipped over many a sledge. And then we struck area after area of crevasses, and frequently our first notification was when the tractor would sink down into one. The vehicles, we had them all roped together for protection with a very strong rope, about an eight ton braking strain. But we knew this would be of limited value in a really big crevasse. Our tracks became peppered with open holes, and I have to admit, I never really got quite used to them. 480 miles from Scott Base we established Depot 480 and at 8130 South we supplied a Midway Depot. Life had become a routine of cold, bad visibility and crevasses. We had many close shaves with disaster and it was a bit of a miracle we didn't lose any vehicles. We became very familiar with the inside of crevasses, an experience that most of us could well do without. We established Depot 700 on December 15, 1957. This was our final depot for the crossing party, and it was already much further out than had originally been planned. We were now only 500 miles from the pole and an awfully long way uh, from anywhere else. We erected our little radio mast and set up our aircraft homing device. After a magnificent flight across the Antarctic glaciers, our single engine Beaver aircraft landed beside the tractors and we unloaded its mail, fuel and supplies. For five days, our pilots operated at the absolute limit of the aircraft range and flew in more and more drums of fuel. Finally, the depot was completed and there was fuel left, 220 drums of it, enough, I felt, to get us hopefully to the pole, but no further. On December the 20th, I had a discussion with my team. My two engineers actually weren't all that enthusiastic about driving on uh, towards the South Pole. Uh, but I was uh, fairly keen, as, as it was Peter Mulgrew, uh, my, uh, probably the, my closest friend of the team. And uh, I said that uh, we were, even if the engineers uh, didn't carry on, they could fly back to Scott Base and uh, we would carry on with one or two of our tractors and see if we could get to the pole. Well, this put them in uh, such a, a tizzy that uh, they decided they would have to go on. Well, away we went. On December the 20th, uh, we headed south again with our three Ferguson tractors. During the first 50 miles, we struck a series of crevasse areas, 
some of them very big crevasses. We had to reconnoitre ahead on foot, testing the ground with ice axes, estimating the safety of flimsy snow bridges. It was rather a difficult and nerve-wracking sector. But then things started to improve. The crevasse areas became less frequent and we were able to make better daily times. A couple of hundred miles from the pole, we struck one of our worst obstacles, deep, soft, bottomless snow. You know, our tractors were pretty good in rough, hard sastrugi but they simply couldn't hand deep, soft snow. We tried everything, relaying our loads, various combinations of vehicles, but it was all hopeless. We established a depot and got rid of every bit of excess equipment and all the extra sledges. For three months, we'd been grinding our farm tractors across the Antarctic Plateau. Our nerves were a little frayed from constant battles with concealed crevasses, deep soft snow, and a growing desperate shortage of gasoline. I had my own secret worry. <coughs> the sextant by which I was navigating my party was proving increasingly temperamental. During the war, uh, I had been a navigator on Catalina flying boats and uh, I had a bubble sextant was my main means of navigation. So I said to myself, would I in fact ever succeed in finding a South Pole station in this vast featureless expanse of snow and ice? Jim Bates, one of my engineers, had grave doubts about my navigation ability. Uh, when he was young, he'd been a Boy Scout and uh, he'd been taught uh, how to find direction by placing your thumb in the air and getting the sun to shine on and put a, a dark line uh, ahead of you. And uh, I used to find it uh, slightly unnerving uh, when I uh, set up uh, my astro compass every uh, time we started to look over <coughs> and see Jim standing there <laughs> with his thumb in the air <coughs> uh, checking uh, my observations. <coughs> well, finally we've been going so long that we just decided that we'd drive grimly on at our top speed of three miles per hour uh, and just keep going until we reach the pole or reach something. <coughs> well, we drove on and on and we kept going for 20 hours. And then I was really starting to feel we would have to stop and have a rest. But out of the corner of my eye, I caught an unaccustomed flicker. With a surge of hope, I stopped the lead tractor and grabbed my binoculars. The flicker was an orange marker flag, our first sign of man in 1,200 miles. Our objective must be near. Out from the pole station uh, came a swift little vehicle with the two senior members of the pole station aboard. And they welcomed us and led us into the pole station itself. So on January the 4th, we reached the pole station and became the first men to drive vehicles overland to the South Pole. I had found our Antarctic expedition a very demanding but satisfying experience. My party had carried out an extensive scientific program, those back at base and all around here and had explored and geologized over thousands of square miles of new terrain. With dogs and tractors and aircraft, we had laid five depots for a Fuchs crossing party and reconnoitred uh, the route towards the pole. The trip to the pole 
had been an exciting extra. At least it had shown that if you were keen and resourceful enough, you could get even a trio of farm tractors across 1,200 miles of snow and ice, crevasse and sastrugi, soft snow and blizzard, to reach the South Pole. Our welcome at the Pole Station was really a heartwarming one. We munched delicious steaks with relics, something we hadn't had anything of for many months. And then we sat in warm comfort, invited to watch a film, a Western film. The hero, the beautiful maid and the villain were all there. The maid and the villain were struggling on top of a great rock face, while the hero down below watched in horror, his muscles bulging in his plaid shirt. In his hand, the hero had a lasso, which he threw neatly above him, and it hitched over a budge of rock. Then, with great skill, he climbed up the rope, hand over hand, something I might say that all we mountaineers would have been incapable of doing. <laughs> well, he reached the struggling couple and cast the villain to his inevitable death far below. A horse somehow appeared and the hero and the maiden jumped aboard and headed off into the sunset. Well, the five of us and our Ferguson tractor team just laughed and laughed and laughed. For weeks, indeed months, we had been under constant tension and danger. The Western was just too much. Our good American friends just couldn't understand it. They thought it was a pretty good film. <laughs> As rolling with mirth, we staggered off to a safe, comfortable beds and drop, uh, dropped off to sleep. It was a long 16 days before Bunny Fook's great snowcats rolled into the South Pole from the Weddell Sea on the other side of the continent. It was getting late in the season now, so I joined Bunny's team as navigator. I mean, Bunny asked me if I would do this, of course, and I was happy to oblige. And we charged back over our tracks from the pole. We crossed nearly a thousand miles of polar plateau, and uh, periodically uh, we would get lost. Now, Bunny Fox and his more senior members of his team uh, were sitting up in the driving seat of the snowcat in a very comfortable uh, situation. Uh, however, Bunny had uh, invited me uh, to get in the back of the snowcat, which was absolutely blacked out, where you couldn't see anything. It was extremely cold. So I just lay there and it was bumped around until they got lost again. And then uh, Bunny would come round and kindly ask me uh, if I would find the way for them for the onward journey. Well, we uh, certainly, I managed to do this on many occasions, and uh, we, uh, I led a devious route down the Skelton Glacier, clattered across the icy lower reaches of the glacier and emerged once again on the Ross Ice Shelf. Making good speed, we travelled quickly over the Ross Ice Shelf round Minna Bluff and wound our way through the pressure ridges uh, until we reached Scott Base to a very warm welcome indeed. By now the sea had commenced freezing over, it was getting late in the season and we were just in time to load all our equipment on board the Endeavour and sail to the north and to New Zealand. Our great journey was over. I must express my appreciation for the enormous help we had from our generous American companions over the hill at McMurdo. 
nothing was too much trouble for them. And Admiral Dufek in particular was absolutely superb. So my thanks also to all of you here who do uh, so much for us uh, across the hill. And if you should find the odd thing in your dump uh, disappearing uh, in that direction over there, just don't worry about it. You know, you've plenty, plenty of other things which you can use. Whereas uh, it might be quite useful uh, to Scott Base, uh, not too far away. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's sort of the uh, story of my early life in the Antarctic. You know, the you couldn't have got a more unsuitable uh, vehicle uh, to drive to the South Pole uh, than a Massey Ferguson farm tractor. Uh, but that was all we had. And one of the great virtues, of course, of these uh, farm tractors uh, was that they'd been donated to us free. And so uh, we had this uh, capacity uh, which we used so generously uh, here in McMurdo Sound of picking up something that wasn't particularly needed and using it for a big adventure. So I enjoyed my time down here enormously. Uh, I can't ever remember, remember uh, wishing uh, that I was home, uh, even though on odd occasions uh, I would ring up my uh, wife and uh, hear my children uh, screaming from one reason or another. Uh, but uh, it was a great, it was a great time down here. Uh, we we didn't really ever uh, feel lonely or bereft. Uh, we had a, a base which was nowhere near as big as our base over there now, uh, but uh, was very effective. It was warm, it was comfortable. Uh, we had excellent supplies of uh, uh, New Zealand wine. And uh, every uh, Saturday night, every Sunday night, uh, we uh, would have, we would give the uh, cook uh, a day off and we would all take turns uh, to cook the evening meal. And then we would test out uh, the particular wines and it usually became a very jolly evening indeed. You know, I actually uh, had decided uh, to um, have my little office inside our main building there. And uh, I built a little bunk above my desk. And that's where I already spent the whole of the winter. Uh, but uh, sometimes on the Sunday night, uh, my party did get a little boisterous. And I was having difficulty uh, in sleeping. And finally, uh, I would emerge in my underclothes uh, from my little office, uh, shout at the half dozen uh, remaining members of the team and tell them to go off to bed. And I'm pleased to say uh, that they usually agreed without complaint. But it was a great time and uh, now that it's almost 50 years ago, I still remember it uh, with great affection, as I'm sure all of you will, uh, your time uh, down here uh, in McMurdo Sound. Thank you very much. Um, so Rita's happy to take a couple of questions, so we'll just sort of see how he goes, and how my voice goes. Uh, yes. How do you feel about John Wright's Traverse? The question was, how do you feel about John Wright's Traverse? John Wright's Traverse. Th that was the question? <laughs> Are you going to 
Well, there have been uh, some uh, remarkably good uh, traverses of the continent over recent years. Uh, when I was uh, pulled down here about four or five years ago, uh, a Norwegian uh, had by himself uh, skied uh, right across the continent um, and uh, he um, uh, had really done a remarkable job in uh, covering that enormous distance. But the actual gentleman you mentioned I'm, I'm not terribly familiar with. Can you, can you shout? Can you tell us about seeing Shackleton's ghost? Oh, the, um, during the winter when the ice uh, was all solid between uh, here uh, and uh, Scott's hut and Shackleton's hut, uh, we did uh, various uh, winter journeys and uh, called in on the hut. Um, Scott's hut was uh, really full of ice and it wasn't uh, really possible to uh, enter. Uh, but we carried on to uh, Shackleton's hut and uh, I was uh, climbing up in the lead of our small group and I had an experience which I, I really have difficulty uh, in explaining. Uh, I went to the door of his hut and was able to shake it open and then uh, I went inside and winded my way uh, into the main room. And then I suddenly saw coming towards me uh, a sort of wispy figure with hands outstretched uh, welcoming me. And I knew that it must be Shackleton. Um, then it disappeared. Now I'm not particularly inclined to uh, have strange ideas of, uh, of creatures like that. But on that occasion, I was absolutely certain uh, that uh, Shackleton, who really was my hero as far as uh, the Antarctic was concerned, uh, was welcoming me uh, to his old hut. And it really was a remarkable experience. What is the most significant event in Antarctic history, in your view? Oh, I think there have been all sorts of heroic things that have been uh, done in the Antarctic. Um, I suppose one would have to say that uh, Amundsen's uh, first uh, trip uh, to the South Pole uh, was certainly the most outstanding uh, effort uh, at that time. Uh, but there have been lots and lots of uh, great adventures, uh, both in the air and uh, on the ground, uh, by lots and lots of uh, brave uh, and heroic men. Uh, the, uh, nowadays, it's, uh, it's not so uh, uncommon, really, uh, to meet people who have uh, travelled um, by uh, towing sledges to the uh, South Pole, it's uh, quite a common thing now. So uh, as uh, with uh, all great adventures, as time passes, uh, many people overcome these problems and they become more a matter of routine. Uh, the same is true on Mount Everest. I mean, uh, on Mount Everest, uh, when Tenzing and I first uh, stood on top, uh, we were the only people that had ever been there. And uh, we could look around at the vast mountains in every direction and uh, felt, you know, a sense of great satisfaction out of the fact that we were the first and, in fact, the only people uh, to have reached the summit. But the same uh, has applied uh, here in the uh, Antarctic. Now uh, people seem to be shooting off in every uh, sort of uh, direction and doing all sorts of amazing things. 
and uh, for instance the work that the uh, American teams do out down here is certainly uh, uh, most astonishing. Even the airfields are something that uh, we didn't have much idea on. We actually had an airfield just over by uh, Scott Base and uh, we landed our two little aircraft there and as was mentioned before during the winter uh, we kept them uh, operational and uh, they used to do uh, flights on a nice uh, moonlight night and uh, beat up uh, McMurdo Sound uh, much to the disgust uh, we found of the uh, American pilots who had uh, been ordered to uh, leave their aircraft uh, uh, well secure in their base here. But um, I think people, uh, adventures grow and grow and grow. <coughs> I think to have been the first uh, to do uh, a great adventure is uh, um, you're very lucky uh, to have achieved something like that. Uh, it's something that uh, you will always remember. And uh, so for me, climbing Everest and, uh, and going in our farm tractors to the South Pole uh, were great adventures. Uh, may maybe they were a little bit stupid at times, but they <coughs> were undoubtedly great adventures for us. And uh, I think all of us uh, remember them with uh, great fondness. What became of Tenzing after your ascent to Everest? Oh, well, Tenzing uh, lived on for quite a long time, but then he, uh, uh, he, was, he wasn't really a very happy man in, in later years. Uh, the um, Indian government had promised uh, to him uh, various uh, awards uh, for his uh, great deeds, um, and they didn't really uh, carry out. Uh, the, many of the things they promised. Uh, so uh, he largely conducted uh, trekking parties around about uh, the Darjeeling area. I saw quite a bit of him, particularly when I was a New Zealand ambassador to Delhi. Um, but he seemed to get sadder and sadder almost. And even though I kept telling him that he was still doing tremendous uh, things for the young people of India in particular, uh, he just wouldn't believe it. He felt uh, that uh, he had been neglected and uh, that he uh, um, wished that he had done uh, more of the things like I was involved in. Well, then he, got, he drank quite a bit and uh, he uh, got uh, very ill and he finally died. Now, the... Uh, my wife and I were the only uh, foreigners who actually attended the funeral. Uh, it was a period when up in Darjeeling there was a lot of uh, political problems and uh, no foreigners in general were allowed up there. Uh, however, um, we were determined uh, to be present at the Tenzing funeral. Uh, so the uh, Indian government uh, supplied a... Uh, a jeep and a, um, a rather intelligent, I thought, uh, lieutenant, and uh, he started driving us up the winding hill uh, towards uh, um, Darjeeling. And uh, we'd arrive at the first visit, and then everybody would emerge and block the road and stop us. But the lieutenant was a very intelligent lieutenant, I thought, and uh, he would uh, say to uh, all the people, let the great man pass. He wishes to see the last of his fellow companion. And they would all split and let us through and up we'd go until the next village arrived and the same thing would occur. So my wife and I were the only foreigners uh, to be uh, present at the actual uh, function of... Uh, of uh, Tenzing's uh, um, 
when he died. The question was, what is your next great adventure? Well, I, I have one little problem now, and that is that I'm 85 years old. <laughs> However, you know, there was some doubt about uh, whether I would survive getting back down here to make that sound, but seem to be going all right so far. <laughs> Take one more. What would be your next great adventure? <laughs> well, there's one thing. Um, I one thing I always I was never short of uh, plans for adventures. Uh, when I completed uh, uh, some uh, task. I would always have in my mind a sort of the next step that uh, I would make. Uh, we uh, um, climbed Mount uh, Herschel and, uh, and then we uh, crossed over uh, the uh, glacier to the uh, open water towards, uh, towards New Zealand really. And um, I uh, then looked over into the next valley, and there was a beautiful valley there. It was a glaciated valley, uh, but um, with beautiful peaks. And I thought, my goodness, uh, that, that would be a really good expedition. Uh, however, it was one expedition I was never able to make for some reason. And I'm sure either someone has already done it, or it still remains there for some young and uh, enthusiastic adventurer uh, to overcome. The world is still full of places that uh, have not been conquered. In China, the mountain range after mountain range uh, that uh, are still unclimbed. So I still say to the young who bemoan the fact that there's nothing left to do, don't you believe it, there's plenty left to do but you have to look for it. Mr. Edmund, it's been such a privilege to be here with you tonight. And just to let you know a bit of our plans for us, this was Sir Edmund's wish to come back here, but we're also doing a documentary which we hope to do with the United States, celebrating that Ed was, was the, the architect of the New Zealand Science Program and uh, the, the, the founder of our program, and we owe so much to Ed. And we really want to do a uh, documentary that celebrates both the United States and the New Zealand program and Ed's involvement in it. Also, Ed's never been to Lake Vanda, so on Tuesday we're taking Ed to Lake Vanda. He's popping in to have brownie with Ray Spain at Lake Hoare and uh, Polly Penhull and uh, to look at the long-term ecological research project, which is quite a mouthful, Ed. <laughs> but, um, and also tomorrow night we're opening the very open Hillary Field Centre, which is still not filled in yet, but uh, Ed specifically chose this time of year to come here uh, because he thought the base would look very pretty with a lot of snow around it. <laughs> <laughs> and on Wednesday night, we're opening the Scott Bay ski field and we're offering Ed the first run. <laughs> oh, not me. <laughs> and on Thursday, it's Mount Herschel. See, <laughs> so Ed, just such a privilege to have you here tonight. I'll pass over to Dave. I'd like to thank you on behalf of this entire community. I've never seen this many people <laughs> all together in one place at McMurdo, and I think it's our expression of how pleased we are that you could come and visit us this evening. Oh, so another round much. of applause.
Ladies and gentlemen, I just thought I'd tell, uh, mention uh, one adventure we had uh, during the course of our time down here, uh, which uh, remains very clearly in my mind. Uh, we had uh, established a base up on the Polar Plateau uh, at the uh, head of the uh, Skelton Glacier. And um, I had flown in, I had flown in with uh, uh, one of the uh, two pilots. This was our young pilot, Bill Cranfield, who was a a uh, very good pilot, but as crazy as you can, can possibly imagine. And um, we flew up above the base, but the wind was blowing uh, very ferociously, so we couldn't land. So we had to turn around and fly back over the mountains and back to Scott Base. Well, unfortunately, on the way back, we both, uh, because we'd been in the air a long time, uh, we both uh, felt the enormous desire to go to the toilet. Uh, but of course, in our little aircraft, there were no toilets, uh, so uh, we knew we would just have to suffer until we got back to Scott Base. But then we were flying over the mountains, and below us uh, we could see a little glacier. And uh, I said to Bill, um, Bill, you know, the things are getting a bit grim. Uh, do, you think, uh, do you think you could possibly uh, land on that little glacier down there? And Bill looked down and said, sure, nothing to it, yeah. You know, pilots are a little bit that way, some of them. And uh, so he circled around, uh, bumped over a, a number of uh, rather small crevasses, and came to a halt right on the edge of a whopping big crevasse. And we leapt out and relieved ourselves, feeling marvellous. <laughs> and then we got back uh, in the aircraft and uh, uh, Bill uh, wheeled it around and we went back up the hill a bit and then he gave it everything it had and it just cleared uh, the uh, big crevasse which has stopped us before. And we sailed off into the air and flew very comfortably all the way back to Scott Base. But our senior pilot, uh, who was absolute, was a very good pilot and uh, did a wonderful job for us, but he was a rather formal gentleman. And he certainly did not approve of us popping in uh, to uh, a crevasse uh, the crevassed area in order to go to the toilet and uh, he, he gave Bill a bit of a rough time with this. However, I uh, asked him if he'd uh, treat uh, uh, Bill kindly uh, because after a while, after, uh, if he hadn't, uh, there could well have been uh, disastrous consequences. <laughs> Thank you.